We'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's portion of the Tree Care Workshop. My name is Larry Rupp. I'll be the moderator for the, the session this afternoon. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker. Many of you, I'm sure, already know Dr. Mike Coons from Utah State University. Uh, Mike has been an extension specialist there since 1992 and is a product of the, the Midwest and Auburn University. Uh, he's done a lot of very good work at, at Utah State, especially in uh, some of the publications that he's come up with on uh, tree recommendations and landscape trees. So we're very pleased to have him here, and if you can give it up for Mike Coons. Thank you. If we want this or this or this, or these, this, even this, we need these. We need tree root systems. Successful tree growing is growing a good root system. And you've often heard me in past years, if you've heard me speak at these conferences, heard me talk about managing in accordance with nature uh, because the trees and, and the reason we do that as opposed to uh, if we were trying to grow uh, tomatoes or petunias is because trees mostly are na natural organisms that have been brought fairly recently in terms of their, their genetics into our landscapes. So a white oak growing in somebody's yard in sugar house thinks it's a white oak growing in a woodland in Missouri where its acorn came from or its genetic stock originally came from. So we have to manage with nature because these are not highly genetically manipulated plants that have been manipulated to be what we want them to be. They think they're natural, growing out in their natural environment. And so we have to try to provide those kinds of environments. When it comes to growing a good root system then, we need to know something about nature and natural root systems, and then we can plan for that. So what do we get when we uh, look at natural tree root systems? They're shallow, they're horizontal, they're wide, all those kind of go along together, go along with this as well, which is no tap root if mature and they go along with the idea of what you might think of as a root plate. And these first few pictures are each supposed to illustrate one of those concepts, but in reality they all uh, intermingle with one another. Uh, this is a picture you've sometimes seen me, uh, especially if you've taken the arborist school in the fall when I do tree biology on the first day. Um, I show this picture of a white spruce root system in a spruce forest, probably somewhere up in northern North America. But I photoshopped it and actually was able to pull that root out a little better. It's just such a great illustration of how shallow tree roots are, also how wide. Um, and uh, this is an incredible picture uh, from a tree biology book uh, where they went out in a spruce forest, a native forest, and those are all white spruce trees. White spruce uh, grows in the Black Hills, but mostly it's up in Canada, uh, all the way across Canada, and um, has very narrow crowns. Probably the crowns of these trees would be 15 to 20 feet wide, because they're all competing with one another. And, and all they did to photograph this root was peel the organic matter layer off the forest floor and not dig at all. They did do a little digging to see how deep the root went, and it went zero to 10 centimeters below the level you see, so it went down as much as four inches. But this one root extends out 66 feet in one direction from the tree it comes from, and the tree it comes from is not this one here, it's this one back here with that white dot on the trunk. So snaking out through the forest, came out 66 feet in one direction. You take that times two, you're talking 132 foot wide root system for a tree that's probably about a tenth of that in the width of the crown, a little more. 
And then they painted the root white so they could photograph it. But imagine if you uh, painted all the roots white in that whole forest, exposed them all, and then painted them white so you could see them. This would be nothing but roots. You wouldn't be able to take a step without stepping on roots. And tree roots uh, intermingling with one another, under and overlacing each other. Uh, so really incredible, great absorptive systems. Another illustration of width, but also of the horizontal nature of tree roots. Uh, these are the, those cra crazy British decided to uh, dig up. There, there's a, if you want to read about roots and root systems and stuff, I suspect if you did a Google search on East Malling, M-A-L-L-I-N-G, there's a, a research facility there where they do a lot of tree fruit research and uh, they've done a lot of rhizotron research with pits to look, underground pits with clear surf surfaces on one side to look at uh, root growth. And that's where this is from. This is a 16-year-old apple tree uh, that had been growing out in the, in the uh, orchard and then they dug it up and then suspended the root system about like it was in the, in the field. And look how horizontal and wide that is well beyond the crown. And you can imagine if that's about a foot, most of the root system being in the top foot and going well beyond the crown. Some deep roots, but much less than the shallow roots. And again, this, this is to represent wide, but also represents shallow and horizontal. It all intermingles. A red, a red maple back in a forest somewhere in the eastern United States with each of these dots being a tree growing in that forest and one root exposed and then mapped out to where they could project it on a map from above. Uh, one root going out, these are to symbolize the fine roots at the ends of each woody root. Uh, but this one root was going out, I estimated about 60 feet in one direction. And of course that's only one root from that one tree and there would be many, many other roots intermingled within that forest. And that circles to represent about what the size of the crown might be at the most. So don't ever be thinking when you hear uh, that the important part of a tree root system is under the drip line, the edge of the crown. Don't ever be thinking that's where it stops. I think the drip line on non-fastigiate crown trees, non-upright narrow crown trees can be a useful idea, like if you're trying to save some root system in a construction project, that can be a good place to hold the line. But don't think things stop there. Root systems go well out beyond there. Uh, no tap root. I didn't have any good tree tap root pictures because there really aren't any. Other than trees, when they grow their first root out from their seed, often a root strikes downward. But fairly quickly, those roots that go down, even in a pea or a bean like we see illustrated here, uh, those strong downward growing roots start to reach the limits of their ability to do well, especially with lack of oxygen. Because roots need oxygen and they reach a level where they're not getting enough and then the root system will start growing horizontally. And in trees, since they're woody and they grow woody roots and the root systems get bigger every year, they tend to get bigger horizontally, bigger and bigger every year. They do get deeper every year to some extent, but as soon as they reach the limit of their ability for those roots to survive, that's it. So don't think in terms of tap roots with trees. Think instead of this, that plate concept of a, a goblet, a wine glass sitting on top of a really wide plate, that being the nature of tree root systems with the plate of roots going out very wide and shallow horizontally and much wider than the typical crown once the tree gets established. And you can see these root plates uh, in trees that have tipped up in the forest or even in uh, cultivated landscapes. Uh, sometimes, especially spruces in a spruce forest, you'll see where there's been blow down and up will tip half of the what's left of the root system in this kind of a plate fashion like this. This is a very shallow plate that tipped up when this spruce, spruce fell over. 
Uh, by the way, that sidewalk on the right was put in just a couple of years before. And root, root systems are like this for a reason, shallow, wide, horizontal, uh, because that's where the tree's roots can get what the, tree, the roots need. They need oxygen, water, space, and minerals, and all except for maybe space are most available shallow, at shallow levels of the soil. And of course, in terms of going wide, the wider the tree can get its root system out, the better, because the more re resources it's going to have available to it. So we need then to think about those things when we try to provide for a tree to grow a good root system. And again, following nature to, to provide that water, access to water and access to oxygen, access to minerals and space. And, and this is the rest of what I'll talk about is uh, planting good plant material. When I, when I give a talk like this, when I give an assignment to, uh, sometimes I'm asked what I want to speak on and sometimes I'm not. <laughs> And all I do is try to come up with an outline that makes sense to me that encompasses everything I can think of that's important about the subject. And in this case, this is what I came up with for how to follow nature to grow a good tree root system. And that's getting good plant material, planting it right, uh, maintaining the tree, and I'm talking about later on maintenance, not so much at planting time, but later on. And finally, repairs, uh, which is related to maintenance, but uh, repairs of obvious damage to tree root systems or damage that's going to happen. Okay, good plant material. I'll cover each of these alive, wide enough, well-formed, and having species site compatibility. I say alive. <laughs> I didn't have alive in there. I rewrite talks a bunch of times before I finally uh, and done with them when they want the handouts and I have to lock it in place forever. Uh, and I didn't have this one in there and then I realized there's a fair amount of times when I've looked at planting projects gone bad where really the tree and the root system was dead or nearly dead when it went in the ground. And this is the only slide I'm going to show on that subject, but in this case Many of these trees, all the trees on this side, not so much in the median, but on this side, the other side of the, of the double lane, uh, double wide street, you can see some dying or dead trees. These trees were planted wrong, but in addition, that most of them had been sitting on a asphalt parking lot, or maybe it was a gravel parking lot, from when they had been delivered sometime the previous early summer until the following summer because they weren't ready for them when they came in and they were planting dead or dying trees when they put them in the ground and then there were some planting problems. So make sure you have live trees, live roots. Wide enough root balls to encompass enough of the root system. 10 to 12 inches of root ball diameter, you've all heard this before, for every inch of caliper and that's a minimum. So a wide root system is much more important than a very deep root system because of that horizontal nature of tree root systems. If the tree is dug narrow, like if you dug this one, imagine that was a tree grown in the nursery and you dig a fairly narrow but fairly deep root ball, you're not getting that much more important root volume than if you would go a little shallower but wider. So wide rather than deep. And generally, the nursery industry is pretty good at supplying us with, with wide enough root systems. They're being dug adequately. Sometimes you see some pretty marginal stuff where you, know, you may have eight inches of root ball diameter per inch of trunk diameter. But you're wanting to buy as much root system as you can. Then well-formed root systems. There's lots of problems right now, I think they still exist, with uh, especially potted tree root systems, container grown tree root systems, where these trees, this is not an unusual tree, all you're seeing there is root. There's not a single bit of soil you're seeing. So you're seeing some uh, soil, well, soilless mix here at the surface, but all this on the side is solid roots growing horizontally in a circle around this thing, and it's not unusual. Uh, one 
possible solution to this, Greg showed in uh, one slide this morning, is in some way slicing off that outer layer of that root ball before you put it in the ground, and maybe the bottom layer as well. His idea was a pruning saw. Mine was, uh, uh, you know, the electric knives you used to carve turkeys with? Maybe something like that. Um, but, but I think there's just an awful lot of problems with potted tree root systems currently. This root ball also, or this uh, root collar, this was not the root collar. The root collar was about down there buried in that mix. Uh, so it had a buried root collar as well. And on this tree, it's very hard to expose that buried root collar because of the tangle of roots that are there. Yes? If you had one like that, could you gently wash away that? Uh, you can't gently do anything with this. It's so dense. We actually tried. Oh, I don't have another picture. I have pictures of this tree on the left. It's in a tub because we tried washing it, and it took forever and uh, was just such a tangled mess that I think the slicing off the edges would be the best. But you still have to somehow try to expose that root collar uh, at the top, too. Uh, and that would be much more difficult to do. Maybe a little easier if you sliced off the edges. And you can end up with trees like that one on the right there. This tree, this potted tree, will do really well when first put in the ground and for a few years. But eventually when the trunk reaches, starts to reach about the limit of the where the circling roots are, that's when you get into problems. This also was due to uh, extremely compacted soil when that tree was put in the ground not just because it was potted. Mike? Yeah. Uh, these uh, tree containers that have been appropriated that have been rough and you have holes in the side of the air for these and do it for those. It's better. Uh, I haven't seen anything that stops circling roots, but it would be better. And there's grow bags where uh, that are permeable to where roots can grow out through the, the uh, I think it's probably some kind of geotextile. And, and that would be better. Uh, but any, just as a rule of thumb, if you find that you're getting lots of circling roots, then, then to the extent that's a problem, uh, then it's not a great system. Sometimes you see ridged containers. The idea is that the root would, would hit the ridge and not know to grow around it, but it seems like they do if they're in the pot long enough. Uh, bald and burlap I'm much more enthused about, even though this one had a buried root collar about five, six inches, you can just peel off the top layer of soil to expose the root collar, and you get a much more natural spreading root system. You don't get as much probably total biomass of root in this plant as you do in the other one, in this one, but it's much more naturally arranged and, and much more likely you're going to get some good roots growing out from that in the right direction and not have problems later on. And bare root if you can do it. Because uh, bare root, you know what you're getting, you know where the root color is, uh, but it's, you're going to be limited to smaller stock and uh, limited in what you can get too. This is just to point out that besides the circling root problem, the root bound problem, uh, I wanted to mention here, show you the, a buried root collar where that had been the surface of the root ball and that's where the root collar was just right above his finger there. There's actually roots coming out above there but those were adventitious roots that formed after the extra material was put over the tree. I think this was a pot, uh, this was a bald and burlap tree but the additional soil had been there for a while. And this was another factor I only thought later to put in. Uh, to grow a good root system for a given site, sites have limitations. Most sites aren't great places to grow trees, most urban sites. And so you have to think of, if I've got a tough site, I try to make the site as good as possible, but I also try to pick a tree that's amenable to growing on that tough site. So for example, this landscape, which I don't know exactly where the access to soil below ends, but it's probably about here, because this is the roof of a underground part of the Marriott Library at the U of U, I believe. I've never been down under there, but I'm told this is a roof. And uh, so, and then you've got pavement, pavement, a fountain here, which would have deep footings, a fountain here, 
and a, fairly, uh, a wall behind here with deep footings. So a fairly limited place to grow a tree root system. So you better grow, not grow a red spire linden because it's going to be scorched all the time and in bad shape or you're really going to pour the water to it and have to really baby it and instead grow something like a pine or an oak or something that's going to be a little more amenable to that more limited site. And those are just examples of... I, I'm sorry, I used to like lindens a lot more, but I, I get down on lindens now. and I don't mean to, except for red spire, I get down on red spire linden no matter what. Okay, let's see, that was good planting stock then we need good quality planting and site preparation. And you've heard most of this from various speakers before in the past, but this is how it, I kind of outlined it this time thinking about it. You need adequate rooting volume that's going to be available to your tree. And often if you don't plan for that rooting volume at the time of planting, it's going to be too late to get it later. You need a wide shallow hole to reflect the shape of the root system the way it wants to grow. You need a proper depth, plant at a proper depth, at or above grade. Remove packing materials, backfill carefully, and generally don't use amendments. So what is adequate rooting volume? It's been quantified pretty well by uh, a number of researchers, uh, all of whom were doing various types of studies, but uh, when you boil it all down, various experts, Thomas Perry, long retired and from North Carolina, uh, Nina Bassett, James Urban. When, it, when you boil down their numbers, it comes to about 60 to 120 cubic feet of soil per inch of trunk diameter is what it takes in pretty good soil conditions, not great, but pretty good, to grow a tree of a given size. Uh, so if you want to grow uh, a 24 inch diameter tree is going to take a bigger soil volume, rooting volume, uh, to grow that tree than if you want to grow a 12 inch diameter tree. And if you limit the amount of rooting volume for a tree that's really sensitive to things like drought especially, uh, lack of water, then it may not do well. You, you may not even be able to grow the size that you've sized the the site for. So uh, what I'm saying is a juniper probably needs less effective root vol rooting volume than a, than a linden uh, or maybe a red maple or something. Uh, another way to put it, I think this is from Nina Bassett, yeah, was a foot and a half to two cubic feet of soil per square foot of crown area. And that'd be for a non-narrow crowned tree. So let's say a Norway maple, a Crimson King Norway maple, if you took the, the area under the canopy, uh, which is the crown area, and had soil two feet deep under that in, in a circle around that tree, that's enough rooting volume, two feet deep. However, if you had a tenth of that and went ten times as deep, that doesn't count because you're starting to get so deep in the soil that it's not effective rooting volume. It's not volume available for the tree to grow roots in. If it's too deep or too compacted or too poor a soil, like too much rock or something. So it's got to be pretty good soil. And I tried it with that apple tree we saw earlier, estimating just these numbers weren't in the article, but I just estimated visually. If we figure that tree has a six inch trunk diameter and root system may be 16 feet deep or wide by two deep. That comes to 400 cubic feet. I'm assuming this tree was doing pretty well until they dug it up. And that comes to about 67 cubic feet uh, of soil or rooting volume per inch of trunk diameter. And that's well within that 60 to 120 cubic feet. So it's plausible. And if anything indicates that maybe, at least for an apple, that uh, 120 is maybe on the high side a little bit. But again, the species is really important. A really tough species, a species known for dealing well with very compacted sites, you're going to need much, proportionally much less rooting volume than one that's a very sensitive species. How much rooting volume you think you'd need per inch of trunk diameter on a uh, 
tree of heaven. Just enough room for it to force its way through the crack in the pavement. It redefines what effective rooting volume means. To achieve adequate rooting volume, it doesn't have to be a circle around the tree. It can be long and narrow. It can include space under pavers if, and under even poured pavement if the poured pavement is done right, sometimes even if it's not. Often tree roots are found right under the pavement under a street uh, where you get little voids that the roots will grow within. I don't know that you'd get that in St. George here. But these, uh, these are kind of big pavers, but these slabs that are maybe a foot by two foot on a side presumably are helping support these trees that otherwise wouldn't have enough rooting volume if you were just counting what's in that concrete cutout. Uh, but these trees, especially given that they've picked some species, I believe, that are very heat and drought tolerant, may do just fine in this long, narrow strip and may use much of it as well as possibly going underneath the street. Yes? Is uh, concrete or asphalt porous enough to allow oxygen into that rooting? Asphalt and concrete probably don't allow very, very much oxygen entry through their surface. There is some porous asphalt that's been developed, uh, permeable, there's a term for it, uh, permeable asphalt and maybe concrete too. There's some problems with it if you use a lot of salt uh, getting and have a lot of fines getting things clogged, uh, but the idea would be using this stuff poured over areas that you've also used engineered or structural soils that have room for, that can be compacted adequately for a street, but at the same time where you want to have some volume that roots can access. But there are enough cracks in pavement. This is a new project, but there are enough cracks in pavement. That's where trees tend to make uh, access resources that otherwise you wouldn't think were available to them. They go to, they go to the cracks and the spaces. And I'll mention a little more about porous pavers and structural or engineered soil later. Just pavers like this, this tree probably, these trees probably are using soil accessible under this concrete pavement, but much better for them is this, uh, rather than paving right up to them and maybe using iron grates when you get right near the tree, is, uh, the, are these loose pavers laid in sand. It's a great situation for these trees. Probably almost better than if it was turf. Just because the turf would tend to get pounded down by people using the parking and the sidewalk and and I think these pavers may be uh, at least as good as turf and maybe even better. And the trees are doing real well. These are northern red oaks and um, they've almost doubled in size. Although I think somebody using a string trimmer a little aggressively there, but. Structural soils, this isn't a workshop on that, but uh, there's a number of types of them. CU soil is one that uh, Nina Bassett and others developed at Cornell. Uh, it's marketed by a company that under license with them. But the idea behind these are various materials, in this case, sharply angled rock of an inch to two inches maybe in diameter that when fully compacted enough that you can pave on top of it and the engineers are happy with the compaction, it still leaves voids bridged over by these sharp angled stones. In those voids is a soil material that roots can grow through. It's got to be limiting compared to open non-compacted soil, but in some cases you don't have an option to have that kind of situation. So this is when you want to be able to pave and still have uh, roots go under the pavement. A wide shallow hole. This is taking it to extremes. This is not my picture, it's Jim Flott's picture, but the wider the better. And at least three times the root ball diameter should be the size of the hole. So you have room to work. Think about three times. That's one time. That's one time. That's one time. So it's just a circle three times as wide as that root ball. That's not that outlandish. And you wouldn't need to dig a hole this wide if you really wanted to get on it and, and do things well for that tree. Think of it as just dig a hole a little wider than the root ball, 
uh, wide enough to work and then till up the rest of the area if you could, if there's not irrigation in the way. Uh, but the wider the better because you're going to give, uh, g generally you're going to end up with backfill that's less compacted than the soil that's on the site. So the wider you can dig, the less compacted the soil is going to be for that root system to move into. And until that tree root system has moved out of that root ball and moved at least as far as three times its width, uh, you haven't successfully established that tree. You need to do whatever you can to let that root system grow, especially horizontally, uh, as wide as possible. And then the hole shallower than the root collar depth, uh, well, the root ball depth below the root collar. And actually a little above grade can even be fine, as long as you bring the soil up to the root ball. Proper depth, just remember to plant deep enough. We have a lot of trees planted too deep because we have very root collars coming from the nurse, the wholesale growers, and people forget to expose that buried root collar and plant at that level. But we also have a lot of trees that go in with the root collar at the right level and they're just planted too deep. So we need to pay attention to both of those situations. This tree was about eight inches too deep, mostly because it was planted that way. Remove packing materials. These are pretty bad examples of just putting a tree in a hole and walking away. If it's hard to remove the materials, you didn't dig in a wide enough hole. And backfill carefully, or at least backfill at all. In this case, I'm pretty sure they were digging holes. They'd eyeball the root ball and dig a hole the size and shape of that root ball and drop the root ball in. There was no backfilling going on at all. But roots don't do a good job of growing across voids like that. Uh, so make sure you backfill and pack adequately, but not too much, especially if it's wet. You can see roots growing through that burlap there. And there's a suberized root there. When the roots are a little older, they turn brown. Uh, and these roots may have had a chance of growing across here eventually had I not uh, put my hands under there. This is that tree I've shown before that I actually could put my arm all the way to the shoulder underneath the root ball. Uh, amendments, unless you had a very poor soil, and this is like pure sand, you really don't need to fertilize or use other amendments at planting time. Uh, if you do, you incorporate them thoroughly and use well composted organic matter. But the main amendment, especially in Utah, is water. Uh, they need water and lots of it, especially to get established. And then on to, so we've done planting now. We got good plant material. We planted it right. Now we're going on to regular maintenance for the life of the tree. And in Utah and place, uh, many places in the West, that usually means irrigating for the life of the tree. Uh, so, and irrigating appropriately. Mulching and not using fertilizer. Irrigating appropriately is a thing that people want hard and fast rules. Okay, I turn on my hose coming out of the pipe from my house. How long do I turn it on if I turn it all the way on? Well, I don't know. I don't know whether there's uh, site slopes and the water's all going to run off. I don't know how compact their soil is. I don't know how fast their hose flows. Uh, so you need to dig a little deeper and moisten the soil as deep as the root ball or greater and, and moisten as wide as you're going to need that tree root system to be able to grow. So if it's in a long, narrow planting strip and you know the tree's going to need that for effective root volume for 30 or 40 feet down the strip, if you don't water there and no water gets there naturally, there's not going to be roots there. Roots don't grow in through dry soil. Uh, extend the irrigation out as the tree grows and, of course, don't saturate for long periods where you have no oxygen available in the, in the uh, soil. And most of the trees we grow need on the order of 20 to 40 inches of, of water a year. Now that's based on where they come from. Uh, most of the trees we grow, just where they grow naturally, need about 20 to 40 inches a year. Some species you could get by with less than they actually get naturally. Some species 
uh, because of us growing them in hot, dry situations with a lot of wind, might need more than they would get naturally. What's an example, for example, a species we've had a lot of troubles with in the last few years because of water? People can think of all sorts. Uh, I was thinking blue spruce and Norway spruce. Spruces, uh, where they grow naturally in Utah, where blue spruce grows naturally, it's probably get, it's in moister sites, plus it's probably getting uh, maybe 40 inches a year, 35, 40 inches a year of natural precip. Most of that's coming in the winter as snow, uh, but some of it's coming in the growing season as well. If you try to grow those same trees, even on that same amount of water down in the valleys, it may not be enough. On the other hand, uh, junipers get by just fine with very little extra precipitation once or irrigation once established. You need to know the species and know its needs. Uh, that 20 to 40 inches a year, if we're talking, let's say, uh, American linden, where it grows back in the eastern half of the United States, uh, might get 35 inches, 40 inches of precip a year. But a lot of that's coming in the summertime. And most of the snow we're getting now in this storm won't be very useful to trees in July. It's long gone. And so we need to put extra on in the growing season for those species that are pretty sensitive to drying conditions. Okay, mulch, don't do too deep, especially if there's a lot of fine material in it. This has a lot of soil in it. Uh, so it's way too deep. You're likely to damage the root color there. Uh, this is about right. It's mounded up a little. And mulch as big an area as you're comfortable with. People want to know how wide to mulch. And I say yes. The wider the better. Just try to simulate a forest if you can. If you don't want to have any turf, then mulch the whole thing. The fertilization just generally is not needed for most trees in most situations and hasn't been shown to increase root growth. Often you can increase top growth, uh, but you may do it at the expense of the root. Repair is my last section. Uh, basically, I wanted to talk a little bit about aeration and vertical mulching, root collar excavations, which I think is a, a thing that needs to be done more, and then construction mitigation. Aeration and vertical mulching, I think, has a place to where you're trying to repair a situation where you've got compacted soils and you want to introduce some oxygen into these areas and you can uh, dig trenches like this. This would be radial trenches. You could even put eight of them in if you wanted and uh, fill them with compost and that'd be a real extreme situation. People use augers, although normally you'd want to use a power auger instead of a hand auger. An auger a series of holes in and fill them with compost. How deep? As deep as you, as your arms will go. I mean, 12 inches would be a good depth, especially if you had a power auger. And put a hole every foot or 18 inches or something and do it in kind of a grid around the tree. And then uh, I've seen air spades used recently and I'm really impressed with them. And this would be a way you could make a trench out from the tree. I suppose you could even do holes with them, although trenches would use their capabilities a little better. Yeah. I'm not very, you're trying to get, you're trying to reduce the bulk density of the soil. So you have to introduce air to, into it. And what you're doing is introducing some air. You're putting a little compost back in just to hold things open. Uh, but eventually that's all going to kind of collapse and mix. And, uh, and earthworms and such will also move it around. I'm not worried too much about a particular root growing into that hole and not being able to make it out probably going to be a good place for that route. How about hydrojets? Hydrojets. Uh, water jets would be fine, messier, although air spades are pretty messy too. Yeah, in the back there. Um, I just had a question for you about vertical mulching and I said putting some mulch back in. Well, like compost, yeah. Yeah. Would you, would you put any kind of a fertilizer in with that at all? I know you said earlier no fertilizer. But. No. Uh, the only reason to put something in the hole is just to hold it open for a while while the soil kind of collapses around it and loosens up. If you didn't have to worry about high heels and people with small feet, uh, uh, there'd be no reason to close the small holes if they're just a couple inches diameter.
Root color excavation, I don't want to read all this. Uh, this would be signs that maybe you need one. Unexplained gradual decline of the tree, little or no root flare, the trunk perimeter nearing the root ball perimeter when it, from when it was planted years ago, known that the tree is planted too deep or that there's spill over the root system. I think there's a lot of trees need this. Here's two Norway maples at my house uh, a couple months ago, and the one on the left obviously looks a lot different. It took about five years for this to hit me upside of the head. There was something wrong. And a lot of scorch where the other one didn't have it. And when I started excavating, I found girdling roots, potentially girdling roots all over the place. These you're seeing actually weren't the problem ones. They were the ones deeper down that were the real problem. And I excavated, in this case, I don't have an air spade and a compressor, so I used a trowel and a, uh, a shop vac, which I'll tell you is much less messy than a hose and a trowel. And um, vacuumed it all up, but an air spade would be great for it. This guy at this workshop in Minnesota this fall excavated every tree in the park in about half an hour. He got carried away. He actually found this uh, metal edging then that, that had been put on the edge of a new, this, this was a huge American elm, three times the diameter you're seeing off the screen here. And a lot of the large roots on this side had been cut so they could get this edging in where the specs said it needed to be for this flower bed on the right. Don't get me started. <laughs> But this was that maple of mine I excavated. I actually found an old irrigation line buried in there that I had abandoned years ago. Look at this root here. I, I cut off this part, but it's still attached here. It's a little bit like detective work, kind of digging down and knowing what to cut. And I finally cut that out. I wouldn't have known this was one of the original flare roots of the tree that was totally suppressed because of that uh, three-quarter inch diameter root growing through the crotch of it. So I had to dig down to that level to finally see the girdling roots that were important and then remove them. And, and that's just the site all put back to bed. And we'll see how those trees do uh, in the next year or two. Hopefully much better than it had been. In construction mitigation, just protect roots and root collars. Facilitate growth and regrowth when you know growth, roots are going to be hurt. Make sure there's enough effective soil volume left for the tree to root into after the construction project. And then use solutions that are flexible and allow for saving root collars and roots, like uh, using air spades to do excavations. Uh, this is at least good in that they cut these roots cleanly, but how much better would it have been to do something like that? This is Meredith's home city of St. Louis, and this wouldn't have happened if the homeowners hadn't raised a little bit of a stink, but it did. And they meandered the uh, pavement around the root collar of that tree and saved a lot of roots. Uh, rubber pavement like this to replace broken buckled pavement instead of just cutting out all the roots and putting, trying to put concrete back where it was originally. Thank you. Yes, Keith. It looks like uh, this sample of yours with the uh, person roots, is this a little, also a little too deep? It was a little too deep uh, combined with uh, just a lot of circling roots from uh, uh, Norway maples are really prone to it, and these are all Norway maples. Greg? Yeah, I'm wondering about the rubber sidewalks and cold climbers and seats. Um, according to the rubber sidewalk people, the, uh, they've tested them in cold climates and, and they've done okay, but I, I don't, I've not tested them myself, so, yes. Yes, uh, mycorrhiza will be good and my impression is there's very little you can do to ensure that. The tree will have mycorrhizae on its root system, likely from the nursery, and those will be the mycorrhizae that you'll initially have on your root system when the tree is planted, and then you'll get some other mycorrhizae that are in the soil where you've planted the tree 
other than having just a good rooting environment, I don't think there's a lot you can do to uh, uh, amend the soil to ensure mycorrhizae. The obvious fix would be to add mycorrhizal fungi to the soil, and the problem with that is that there's been a spotty success with that, and some of the mycorrhizal inocula actually were found to be dead fungi in a box, so, or a bag. So anyway, mycorrhizae are good, and I don't know that there's a lot you can do about it. It's just good to know they're there. Anybody else? Okay, thank you.